we're gonna cover what is endurance and how you can apply that in a sports specific setting. And we're gonna start right now. If you were watching our last video, okay, our last video went into the seven false beliefs around endurance-based training. So those false beliefs are things that are pretty stereotypical amongst most strength coaches. And if we can just understand that they are rooted in some sense of truth, but we can shatter them pretty easily. And when we shatter them, we can start to make growth as an individual coach and as someone who's gonna have a bigger impact on more athletes. Okay, so I think the next step then is understanding what endurance is. Okay, so if we're a coach and we're trying to reach a large group of people, we're trying to have a positive impact on as many athletes as possible. And we're trying to dominate other athletes and help our individuals become champions, then we have to have a firm grasp on every single strength characteristic. And I like to look at it in a simple sense of, essentially there's four strength characteristic and each characteristic you can mine deeper and really expand but in all reality endurance training is going to be one explosive work is going to be another one so how much force can you produce in a designated period of time this would be known as impulse but we're going to call it explosiveness for this case strength okay how much force can you apply against an immovable object over a longer period of time in theory and how much absolute strength can you develop and then finally speed okay speed being locomotion how quickly can you cover a ground or time based off of a specific time frame? But when we're looking at endurance, we have to understand that endurance is actually based off of indoor. Okay, and what is the definition of indoor? Okay, so if we're looking at uh, the definition of indoor is to remain firm under suffering or misfortune without yielding, so without giving up. And I think that that definition, once we start to engage with strength training or with uh, endurance work specifically, uh, we start to see that you're under a lot of suffering when you're doing endurance training. And that's likely why most of us in this room did not do endurance work growing up because there is a massive amount of suffering and indeed we would yield. <laughs> especially myself, okay? You have those internal conversations. Uh, you know, you're out for a run or you're doing something swimming wise or you're doing an assault bike workout and within 25% of the workout, you start to have conversations of how stupid this workout is and you don't wanna do it anymore and you wanna quit, you wanna yield, you wanna give up, you wanna no longer do this and that makes perfect sense because it's very uncomfortable. And so we need to learn how to endure and we wanna get our athletes to endure and that's part of who we are as strength coaches is the fact that we can enhance their endurance by also enabling them and holding them, in this case, to hold them more accountable to train that endurance. Now, the next thing is taking that endurance, okay, is and that's gonna be the ability to withstand hardship or adversity. That's gonna take us into some of the physiological keys. And when we're looking at the physiology behind endurance-based training, I think we wanna look back at the beginning. Okay, we wanna go back to the beginning of, and back to part one of what we did earlier is that we have to understand that there's a lot of research out there, there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of incredibly intelligent teachers, professors, researchers out there that cover endurance-based adaptations. And if we can just look at endurance from the root, from the base of what it is, we're really just looking for a sense of an adaptation that enables the athlete to do something more. Okay, to get more volume, to get more frequency, to be able to handle that type of training. And I, I look at endurance in the sense of if I'm training a, a power athlete, and I think this is a big one out there. If I have a power athlete, and I'm gonna get you guys into how we actually break down individual athletes into these specific columns or specific uh, realms so that we have an understanding of this is that there's athletes like shot putters and let's say an offensive lineman for football that will benefit the most from a form of training that I believe directly impacts endurance, and that's gonna be something like sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is gonna help us prevent fatigue over a long period of time. If we can do this four to eight weeks, we're gonna see an improvement in muscle protein synthesis. We're gonna see that the individual does indeed improve their ability to resist fatigue, and in turn, they can execute uh, higher intensity movement patterns for a longer period of time, increasing their volume. And that's gonna have a, a little bit of heart implications, but for the most part, we're really looking at like myo-endurance in this case. Now, the other two areas of 
endurance adaptations that we're looking for are gonna be mainly based around that first one being, let's say, uh, looking at increasing blood volume or mitochondrial volume. There's some evidence out there that jogging can increase hemoglobin volume. There's evidence out there that when individuals do specific types of endurance training, they will actually produce more blood. They will actually have more blood in their, in their system. They will have more mitochondria in their system. They will actually have greater levels of capillarization leading to greater levels of oxygen delivery to muscles to then create ATP to then fuel the individual, okay? So that's one method or one form of adaptation. After we look at the sarcoplasmic, we're looking at increasing blood volume. The, the third one being, okay, we're now we're trying to increase cardiac output. So if we have an athlete and we're trying to figure out some specifics around endurance, we can see, okay, now we have blood volume here. And then the, ne the next one would be, okay, how can we increase cardiac output? Okay, so this would be an example for me, for a, a strength example that is relatively similar would be, okay, let's get the individual to have a better, better vertical jump. They have to be more explosive. And in all reality, this method, this adaptation to the heart is similar to having a greater power output. Okay. So if we can increase the cardiac output of the heart, the heart can pump more blood in a given time. Okay. So if the heart can pump more blood in a given time, it can deliver more oxygen. And if we can increase blood volume as well as increase the cardiac output, we're going to see some pretty big impacts. And so these are just three example studies here. One from Brad Schoenfeld, which this study is going to be based around sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which is going to be chasing the pump. Okay. What does that mean? And what are some of the understandings around that? And there's still a lot of misunderstandings around chasing the pump, but also just seeing that chasing the pump can lead to an increase in muscle protein synthesis and a decrease in protein degradation, which is absolutely important. And over a long period of time can lead to some really, really positive sports specific endurance improvements. Okay. So I like to use the example of a shot putter or a offensive lineman. If we do some sarcoplasmic endurance training, along with some other modalities, they are going to be able to take more throws. They are going to be able to recover faster. They're going to be more stable. Okay, now if we're looking at high intensity interval training, this is the style, okay, this is the, the methodology that we would be using typically in most cases to increase cardiac output. Okay, and you can see this, this paper here, high intensity interval training increases cardiac output and VO2 max, that's important. And then finally, there's a massive paper here, adaptations to endurance and strength training that goes really, really in depth into greater levels of mitochondrial or more volume of mitochondria. And that's going to be the adaptations to strength and endurance. And that's going to help us understand that when the adaptation that we're looking for, okay, so if we're looking at when we train athletes, we're always looking for an adaptation. Okay. And if we can just have a baseline understanding of physiology, if we're training endurance in all cases, in, in, in this specific example of this model, this is not including sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. This is just using interval based training or, or long, slow distance work, long periods of time. Essentially we're going to see, okay, if we can increase mitochondrial content, meaning we have more mitochondria to then create more ATP, we have more mitochondrial content here. That's usually going to happen typically from long, slow distance. And then if we have the mitochondria is trained well to improve respiration, to improve their, their processing of creating more ATP, which will then be used for creating energy. Now, all of a sudden we're looking at high intensity interval training and some sprint interval training, but I will say I lumped sprint interval training in with high intensity interval training. It's in our system, what I like to do, and I'm going to lay this out for you as clearly as I possibly can with specific sports, I wanna provide this clean understanding of what endurance training entails, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy training, training where we're trying to increase cardiac output and training where we're trying to increase blood volume or increase mitochondrial content. Okay, so that's essentially the three forms, the lens that we're gonna be looking through. Then as we get into some of the sports specific stuff, I'm gonna show you where that goes into, how you evaluate those things with minimal resources, how you can evaluate them with a lot of resources, and then what they do. But in this case, we're also going to be trying to understand at the baseline what this would be 
four energy systems. Okay, so if we're looking at essentially the three types of energy systems, we're gonna have an alactic system, we're gonna have glycogen in, in the body, and the alactic system will not use carbohydrates, it will not use oxygen to make ATP, it is already there, and we're gonna use that within like five to 10 seconds, okay? So that's where we can see ATP and creatine phosphate system, that, that blue line there on this graph. Then we can get into how is that ATP then replenished? If we're doing something that's, let's pretend we're wrestling and we're in the midst of doing some type of scramble, if I take a shot very quickly, I'm gonna use a lot of ATP very, very quickly. And in this case, if I take a shot and it's five to 10 seconds, I'm gonna use that creatine phosphate. But then as that's happening, my body has to create more ATP to then continue to execute these movement patterns. And that's where we're gonna get into the glycolytic system, which is that, that red line, okay, where it's gonna be you know, zero to 60 seconds, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how well the athletes train some, some genetic factors but that's where we're gonna get into the glycolytic system, is that now we're gonna be using uh, carbohydrates to then convert the carbohydrates to create ATP and provide more energy to the body. And again, this is gonna be some just simple, simple physiology, but I wanna get more into the practical sense, but this is just the, the physiology behind it in the simplest sense. And then finally, if we're in the midst of doing something for more than 60 seconds or two minutes, let's say we're doing something for three, four, five minutes, let's say we're, we're doing something for 35 minutes, right? A, a long, long period of time, there's going to be a point where we're gonna be tapping more and more into the oxidative system, okay? So if we're thinking about using oxygen to create ATP, that's another key component. Some of the harder concepts around this is that we've sort of been taught that, okay, you do something for 10 seconds and you just use alactic, and then you do something for 60 seconds and you just use glycolytic, and then you do something for three minutes and you use the aerobic system of energy. So if we're looking at increasing blood volume, increasing sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, increasing cardiac output, it's like, where does all this stuff play? And we have to also understand that there's going to be some impact from having a, a healthy aerobic system long-term. So if we can increase our aerobic capacity long-term over years, okay, think back to Matt Frazier getting on the assault bike or getting on the rower every single morning every single morning that he did that over a long period of time increasing his aerobic capacity it wasn't crushing his recovery instead it was just him doing something long period of time to try and increase his blood volume increase his mitochondrial volume and that led to a healthier aerobic capacity okay so i'm going to try and show you in this case then when we take these applied endurance adaptations okay so an applied endurance adaptation we're going to be looking for what is a frequency of max intensity so going as hard as possible for as short of a time frame as possible that would be like a, a shot putter taking a throw and throwing pretty freaking hard 85 to 95 percent or 85 to 100 percent that's going to be like tapping into that a lactic system okay the next aspect would be how is an individual recovering between bouts and in this case we'll use the example of the lineman you know they're on a drive they've got a 15 10 play drive something like that Every time that they come off the line, they might be tapping into that alactic system, but then it's gotta get replenished. It's likely going to be replenished with a glycolytic energy production. And so if we have the glycolytic energy system trained as well as the alactic system trained, and maybe some baseline aerobic capacity work, we're gonna see them be able to handle some recovery between those bouts, okay? So we have the frequency of max intensity work, we have the frequency or the recovery between bouts, and then we look at the duration of max intensity. So think about the example I provided with a wrestler. A wrestler is going to be taking a shot, they, they go through a scramble, it might be a minute, a minute and a half of trying to fight through a position. That's gonna be tapping into everything, right? They have to be strong, they have to be explosive, but they also have to have that really strong aerobic base so that they can continue to recovery inside of the match. And then we look at the duration of constant activity. So now constant activity would be uh, a marathon or going out for a run. Total training volume capacity would be how much speed, strength, explosive work, endurance work can the athlete handle over a long period of time and over their training session? So how much of this total training volume can they handle in their session versus one, two, three, four, five sessions in a week versus 
those accumulating over a long period of time. And typically that's where we will see aerobic capacity and sarcoplasmic capacity really come into play. And I think even understanding that from a physiological sense, if our aerobic capacity is trained, we're gonna get about 32 molecules of ATP produced from every molecule of oxygen in the sense of the glycolytic and the alactic system, the, gly the glycolytic system will only see about six molecules of ATP produced. The other thing is, is that the aerobic system takes a little bit longer to produce that, the, that amount of ATP. The glycolytic system's a little bit quicker. So there's some trade-offs here and we have to understand that stuff when we're working through this. And then that leads us into how we evaluate specific athletes. Okay, and so when we're looking at these specific athletes, we've got to understand that athletes have to be evaluated based off of their sport needs. And when they're evaluated based off their sport needs, that's when things start to come to light and that's when we start to really comprehend where we're rolling with everything. Okay, so that's the big key component. I wanted to provide you a couple examples at the most baseline. What is endurance? We're really looking for some cardiac, uh, adaptations. We're also looking for what that the muscular adaptations would be based around sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. How can those aspects lead to some type of physiological improvement? What is that improvement? Okay, so it's blood volume, mitochondrial volume, increase in hemoglobin mass, even looking at things like increase in, in cardiac output. Those are some of those key concepts. And then relating those to the energy systems. Okay, so the energy systems being around oxidative, around glycolytic, around the alactic system and then how that plays a role. And then in our next part of this series, we're going to get into how we evaluate athletes and how we look at endurance and strength and speed and explosiveness and how we break down those evaluations to then lead to that sports specific system that's gonna help you build out the endurance specific to the athletes that you guys are training. And these concepts are exactly what we're using when we're training our athletes here at Garage Strength and how we've developed our brand new programming inside of Peak Strength. If you guys wanna use our system, head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, or the Apple iOS Store. You can get on the program today so that you guys can improve your endurance, you can improve your strength, you can smash those false beliefs and start to really become a champion. Because remember, freaks, if you wanna become a champion, you've always gotta cultivate your power. Peace.